My name is Leah Will. I'm a fisheries biologist out of District 1, which is out of the Springfield office. Um, and so we cover the watersheds of the Black, Williams, Saxons, West River, Deerfield, and as well as the Battenfield watershed. Um, and so what I wanted to do today was to kind of give a, an overview of the West River and the fisheries resources and aquatic habitats. Um, we'll talk about some of the threats um, in general and then threats to the watershed and then some management recommendations that, that I have. A lot of the information that's in the PowerPoint um, is a, was a report that I wrote up for Marie for her uh, basin plan, the basin 11 plan. So a lot of this information will be in there if you wanted to refer to it later. So uh, as you may all know, the West River is a fairly large watershed. Um, it is the largest drainage area in our district uh, with 423 square miles. Uh, the river itself is 46 miles long. Um, and as you know, flows through the towns of Mount Holly, Weston, Londonderry, Jamaica, Townsend, Newfane, Dummerston, and Brattleboro. So quite the reach. So I like to put things in buckets and uh, literally. Um, and so with this, I, I kind of put this into different categories in terms of habitat type. Um, so some of the major features that I would consider is the main stem um, West River. And then obviously you have a lot of tributaries flowing into the, into the West, um, you know, upstream of Londonderry, you've got Flood Brook, Utley Brook, Greendale Brook. Um, and then as you move further down, you've got Ball Mountain Brook, um, downstream of Townsend, you've got Turkey Mountain Brook, um, and um, the Rock River as well, and the Windhall River, some of the larger tributaries. Um, and then moving on from there, we have some impoundments, and this is more or less Ball Mountain and Townsend, uh, where there's large uh, flood control dams that are that are regulated by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, when we say an impoundment, that means that it, you know, alter, alters that riverine habitat. So it, it takes it more from a river and turns it more into a pond, uh, what we would refer to as sort of lentic flat water habitat. Um, that tends to favor more of your pond species rather than riverine species like your trout. Um, I don't know if you folks know, but if back in 2014, I think it was, the um, these flood control dams were retrofitted for hydro operations. Um, and so with that, I had asked the hydro to um, install a downstream bypass facility to protect brook trout um, or trout or any species that encounters the project because those turbines um, are fairly small and they're fast and they cause high mortality if a fish were to go through the turbine, um, they likely would not survive. Um, and in the FERC license, the downstream bypass system was slated for Atlantic salmon, um, but the Atlantic salmon program ended in 2013. So um, <clears throat> we had just asked them to continue that downstream bypass system for those fish species. Uh, moving on to ponds, uh, these are some more uh, warm water ponds. I would consider them to be warm water fisheries, more bass, perch. Um, your centrarchids such as uh, pumpkin seed and bluegill um, and gale metals and low lake. And then we have another unique feature um, at the mouth, which I ter um, term a setback, uh, retreat meadows. We, get, we have connectivity to the Connecticut River, so we get northern pike. It's a very popular fishery. Um, it is influenced by the operations at Vernon in terms of impounding the Connecticut River, but also the flows coming down from the West River. So moving on to the critters that occupy the West River, um, you know, I consider the West River to be an ecologically important river. There's um, state listed mussel species that occur in the river. Um, on the top right is an American shad. Uh, they will pass Vernon um, and we have seen shad 
uh, juveniles uh, rearing in retreat meadows. And so the adult shad come up in the spring, they spawn, and then the juveniles will rear until late summer, early fall, and they'll start moving out um, back out to the ocean. So shad are, are recreationally and commercially important species. Um, another uh, anadromous species that kind of has a bad reputation is the sea lamprey. Um, it has a bad reputation because of the nuisance population over in Champlain. However, in the Connecticut River drainage, uh, they are a native species. They're a primitive species that's been around for 350 million years. They will move up um, same time around the shad does in, the, in usually mid to late May through mid-June. Um, they come in from the ocean as adults. They spawn in the tributaries, including the West River up to Townsend Dam. We've been doing some sea lamprey spawning surveys and we have some telemetry data that shows that they do come up to Townsend Dam and they spawn below. Once they spawn, they, they die and those carcasses provide really important uh, marine derived nutrients to the system. Uh, and Maine has done a lot of research showing that those nutrients actually um, help with the local productivity of, of the river that they're in. Uh, we've also got American eel in the bottom right hand corner, another uh, primitive species, a species of greatest conservation need. They typically uh, will occupy um, ponds that are throughout the drainage basin. Uh, so we see them in Weatherhead Hall. They have historically been noted in the main stem of the West River, but they're not going to be able to get past Townsend Dam. Um, and then we have your brook trout. Um, we don't see a ton of them in the main stem. The main stem's too warm, uh, but we do uh, see them in the tributaries. And I'm gonna show you guys some data that we have. Um, we also have brown trout and then we stock rainbow trout in Townsend Dam and then downstream of Ball Mountain Dam um, in the Jamaica State Park. And then we have your other, you know, cyprinids, uh, black nose days, long nose days, and so on and so forth. So we worked with the um, Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture um, to try and show people that we have a lot of rivers and, and streams in Vermont that support wild brook trout and, and wild brown trout. Um, a lot of people think that we just stock everywhere, but that's not really the case. So this, this map just kind of shows you the blue lines are where we have um, wild brook trout and then the green is, is mixed between um, brown and brook trout. And we don't usually see rainbow trout other than those sort of direct connect tributaries. East Putney Brook, the lower reaches have rainbows. Uh, Morse Brook has rainbows in the lower reaches, um, but we don't typically see them in the upper portions of the West River. And each year we go out and we sample our trout populations. We, we really try to keep a, a pulse on how the populations are doing. So this just shows you guys sort of the point locations. Um, once you get up into Forest Service property, the Forest Service has their own sampling uh, regime and their own biologists. So they typically will sample Greendale, Otley, Floodbrook. They just did Farnham Brook last year. Um, so there is some overlap there with that. Um, we don't sample everywhere. The Forest Service covers a lot of it as well. So I'll walk you guys through this graph. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we sample every year. So a lot of the sampling that was done in the West River was targeted towards the Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program. So we had a really solid data set to go back in time. Uh, the data here is a little bit dated. It goes to 2010, um, but goes all the way back to 1982. And so on the um, y-axis is our number of trout per mile. So this is just an estimate of the population. Uh, we go out, we sample a section of the stream and we run a model that essentially extrapolates those numbers out to a, a a metric of number of trout per mile with error bars on it. So um, the sites are on the bottom in the West 1484. The only thing that means is that it's the West River at elevation 1484. So I did this um, 
you know, you have your upper west reaches and then your lower west reaches. So West 463 is going to be lower in the watershed. And so you can see even the upper reaches West 1426, you sort of see this um, decline as the years go by. And I think a lot of this has to do with the warming water temperatures that are occurring in the main stem. Um, Cause as you can see on the bottom, the light blue, you know, in those lower elevations, they had some trout, um, but they kind of fizzle out in later years. Here's an example of uh, one of the tributaries we sample. Uh, Ball Mountain Brook, um, same thing, population per mile on the y-axis and year on the x. Um, of note here is, is this is a headwater tributary. We're seeing a little bit of a decline, uh, but if you look at the light blue bars, uh, brook trout greater than six inches, that's sort of the adult population, um, seems to be fairly steady through time. Uh, you're not seeing that, that trend line decreasing as much. Uh, Fairbrook, this is one of my favorite streams to sample. Uh, it's your quintessential brook trout stream. Um, same thing here, year on the bottom uh, with your population per mile. And this, this stream, we also monitor for stream temperatures. And this is the one that I consider to be a constant cold. Um, so we don't see a lot of daily fluctuations in temperature. And we also don't see a lot of uh, seasonal variation. It tends to just stay cold um, throughout the summer, which is exactly what brook trout need. And then this is just another similar uh, stream, Baker Brook. This is a little more lower in elevation. Again, you see your uh, greater than six inches tend to be fairly stable. We're starting to see a little bit of decline. Um, but one thing I do want to note is you see there's a lot of annual variability as well. Um, these trout populations tend to fluctuate depending on last year was horrible, it was so dry. Um, so if you have a, a cold, wet winter with a, a good, wet summer, you know, those trout populations will come back. Um, this is just some temperature monitoring data. Um, I'll walk you through these graphs. Uh, this is a box whisker plot. And so the whiskers are gonna be your lowest and highest observation. The line in the middle is your median. So what I just pay attention to is sort of that spread of the box and then where that box lays on the graph. And so you can see Fairbrook uh, temperatures, you know, from 2015 to 2020, you know, we're starting to see things creep up slowly. Um, it's not a drastic, there's annual variability, but we are seeing a little bit of increases there, uh, similar to the Rock River, a little bit of an increase in, in 2020, but not super bad. So moving on to, um, you know, what we consider to be threats, and this is, this is a lot of this I, I pulled out from our um, trout management plan. Um, so walk you through what we consider to be good habitat and what are threats to that good habitat. So good habitat um, is diverse, it's messy, there's wood in there, um, you have good riparian habitat. Um, the picture on the right, you can see a step pool sequence in those pools is where your large, larger adult trout are gonna hang out and feed, whereas you have shallow margins where your juveniles are gonna rear because that's where they're not gonna get predated upon. So you wanna have this sort of complexity with deep water, shallow water, pool riffle run sequence, and the messier the better. Um, riparian vegetation is critical and clean substrate is critical as well. Um, and habitat needs to be connected. Um, we know that, especially with climate change, these colder tributary streams are becoming more and more important. Having access to them is gonna become more and more important as things continue to warm up. So we've been working really hard uh, to get culverts replaced for AOP, or we're doing retrofitting on a lot of them now um, to get them retrofitted so that you know, they, can, they can pass fish. So in, in terms of threats, you know, increased water temperatures, uh, water quality is huge, um, sedimentation, physical habitat al alteration. We saw a lot of this um, after Irene, and I'll show you some pictures of that coming up. Um, flows are a big deal. Um, we're working on the Connecticut River relicensing right now to get that 
flow uh, regime to be a little bit more natural. Um, habitat fragmentation, and then of course our nuisance species. Focusing in a little bit more on, you know, the West River drainage and what I would consider to be threats to this particular watershed. Um, you know, the ski resorts have been around a long time. It's, it's intense development on steep slopes, and these are your mountain streams, um, have been working with them to get their remediation plans um, in place. They have, you know, water quality issues there with runoff. Um, working through Act 50 um, under master plans to sort of look at things a little bit more comprehensively to get, you know, better connectivity, better stormwater, um, and better riparian areas at these ski resorts. Um, the top picture, you probably can't see it super close up, but there's a bunch of dots on there, and that's just from the Natural Resource Atlas in terms of the dams that occur in the area. Um, you know, dams are a big problem. Uh, they alter habitat. So they, as I mentioned earlier with Ball Mountain and Townsend, they take that river and turn it essentially into a pond. So you're, you're changing the flow um, to favor different species. But you have a lot of sediment that gets trapped behind these dams. Um, sometimes that sediment accumulates toxicants. Um, and then there's the obvious, you know, blockage of fish passage upstream. Um, and when you do impound a river, uh, you increase the surface area. So you usually end up uh, increasing water temperatures associated with that dam. There's a lot of research on that. Uh, flow alterations on the right hand side is a graph. Um, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers does a two, two day whitewater release. Um, and this is just showing sort of what happens to the river during that whitewater release where you've got you know, pretty low flows for a while and then it gets spiked up and then drops back down and then goes back up and back down. You know, rivers and riverine species have adapted to flow alterations. That's what a river, rivers are dynamic. It rains, they flood. Um, but I think, you know, when you're a river of this drainage size, you might ramp down and perhaps provide a better base flow overnight, which was what um, the Army Corps of Engineers had agreed to up until 2014. Um, and then riparian encroachments, uh, the West River, as you all know, you know, runs along Route 100 and Route 30. Um, a lot of that main stem does not have any trees along it. Um, so that's gonna, that's gonna increase your water temperatures. And then Tropical Storm Irene, the bottom picture is not in the West River drainage, it's that's over in the Saxons, but this is just an example of, you know, how I showed you that picture of the messy, you know, co complex stream. Um, this is anything but that. You're berming it, so now it doesn't have access to the floodplain. You're essentially creating a fire hose here. You don't have any large boulders. You don't have that stream complexity. It's just degraded. So some, some things that we are trying to work on um, is to protect and restore riparian corridors. We don't have jurisdiction over private lands for you know, keeping trees along the river. So we've been trying to do a lot of outreach with that, um, work with a lot of partners um, to work with our state lands for riparian areas. Um, we're working to improve aquatic habitat connectivity. Um, as I had mentioned, that's just critical. Um, improving flood resiliency, and a lot of this is, you know, getting our culverts adequately sized, getting that floodplain access, um, and restoring post irene impacts has been has been a priority. Uh, we're trying to promote the natural flow regime wherever we have, you know, regulated hydro related flows or flood control flows. Um, protecting water quality and helping to stop the spread of exotic species. The department has. Uh, has a law about moving fish around. Um, so we don't allow people to move fish from one water body to another, although they do. Um, and then we always disinfect everything when we're moving around um, to not spread stuff. Um, so the, the picture on the right is just uh, the drainage area that's above um, the dam. And I, it doesn't include the, you know, the Weston Mill Dam up 
up north, um, but it is a fairly large amount of uh, habitat, you know, aside from culverts that that would be opened up um, for connectivity if the dam were removed. And that is all I had. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Lael. I have a quick question. Uh, when you uh, show that map of, uh, of uh, fish that were both stocked and naturally occurring, there was a section, uh, a short section of, of, of where up, up along here, where fish were stocked, where there were natural fish above and below that. It was just below the, the only, place. so we, I think you're referring to, we used to stock the um, Weston Mill Pond upstream of it. Um, we don't stock that anymore. The only place we stock right now is we stock Townsend Dam um, and we stock downstream of the Ball Mountain Dam. Um, we're very, very strategic in our trout management plan to not stock on top of wild fish. So that's why we stick to these main stem rivers um, that may have flow or be okay for part of the year, but not year round. So that's why we only stock those reaches. Okay. All right, Marie. Oh, sorry. Somebody else have a question? No. All right, Marie. Why don't you take over? Marie Caduto is our mm -hmm. district uh, watershed manager for the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, are you seeing my screen? It's not coming up as shared. Yes, it is. Okay, good. Thanks. So, hi. Um, glad you're all with us tonight. I'm Marie Caduto. I'm what's called a watershed planner for this region. I work for the Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and I, I cover the West Williams and Saxton's River, among others, for watershed planning and um, basically water quality project improvement, watershed restoration work. Uh, so I do, I do London Dairy as well. Uh, so as Lael kind of gave the, the broader overview of the watershed, I'm gonna focus down onto this particular um, piece of the watershed. So I'll go into that. I know it's, coming along a little bit slowly. And let's see if it's gonna, there we go. So one thing I can say about Londonderry, it's got a nice set of wetlands. Um, if you look at all the, the olive green and the bright green, those are all wetlands. The red squares are, and the green squares like down here are all vernal pools. And I, I give the town a lot of credit for getting all these on the map because they can't be protected if we don't know they're there. So whatever work the town has done to document all these wetlands, um, bravo, because that's how, that's how we know that they're there and that our wetlands program um, then can, can confirm that they're there and when development projects come up, can make sure those those wetlands are protected. So, um, good job. <laughs> I'm going to focus down onto this particular wetland, uh, which is here in the grand scheme of the town. And when you focus in on that, you know, you you think about what a wetland is, and there's all different kinds of wetlands. So, as the program is defined. It's a place where the water and the land meet. And the, the key piece is that the, the soils, the, the land is saturated for even just a short period of time over the year, but it is saturated for some time over the year. That's kind of what determines a wetland. And we call wetlands all kinds of things. We call them ponds, like the mill pond. We call them bogs and fens and vernal pools even little wet spots in the forest where groundwater seeps out um, and, and all you see is a small wet patch at certain times of year. Those are indeed wetlands. And the way we determine that 
is we use three piece, three wetland identification pieces. And that's the first one is the hydrology, the water. It does have to be saturated for a couple of weeks a year to become a wetland, to show the other characteristics of a wetland. The second piece is the plants. There are very specific types of plants, as you know, um, that grow in wetlands. They don't grow in uplands. They can deal with the fact that all the air spaces in the soil are taken up with water. Um, there's very little oxygen in those soils. So that, that produces a very specific and unique set of plants that will grow in wetlands. And the last piece is the soils themselves, because when soils are, are consistently saturated, they, they form different characteristics. And we look at those soils and to determine whether or not something is in fact a wetland, it has to have all three of these characteristics. So, so if you're ever doing a project and the wetlands biologist says, no, I can't come out, it's probably because there's no plants to look at. You know, it's, it's January and they're covered with snow. Um, so there, there's only particular times of year that you can really do a wetland determination um, and find out what's really there because you have to be able to see those plants. We base our protections a lot and our values on, on what we call functions and values of wetlands. And there are a lot of these. We use wetlands function and, and provide us basically those ecological services of storing water during floods. They hold back a lot of water. They filter that water as it's coming in filled with sediment and nutrients that those wetland plants are gonna take up those nutrients. They're gonna allow the sediments to settle out and accumulate. As Lael was talking about, they provide really good fish habitat and habitat for other types of wildlife that are very unique to wetlands. Because of that association, you know, very particular plants, there are a lot of rare and endangered and threatened species that, that go along with wetlands. So those are, those are important for us to, to be looking at. They call them exemplary communities because you, you get something like down in Vernon where there's a sweet gum bog, you know, there's and all kinds of very specific types. Lowell Lake has a fen at one end and a bog at the other end, you know, there are very specific types of wetlands. A lot of research and education and recreation are some of the other values and uses that we get from wetlands. And certainly open space, you know. In, in particular, this one right in the middle of the village provides that. Um, and they do provide erosion control. So these are all the values that we place on them and the services really that we get out of them. Not all wetlands have all these functions or all the values. Um, they kind of, they work in concert with each other. So, you know, one will provide open water, one will not provide open water, but will provide cattails that red wings will nest in. You know, they, they work together to form an entire system and a, a very complex system that we rely on. As the state, we protect class one and class two wetlands. Um, and and the, those were the, the green, the darker green on the map. We don't have any class one wetlands right around here, but so most of them are class two. And so anything that happens around a class one or a class two wetland, um, does need a wetland permit to, to go forward. So someone has to look at that wetland and say, yes, you can be here, but you can't be there. All well, part of state regulations. So when you focus on this wetland, so this, the, this dark green part in blue is, is the wetland above the mill pond, and this here is the mill pond itself. Um, when you look at that, you know, we, we look at this, uh, this is a riverine wetland or a floodplain wetland um, because unlike these ones that are detached in the, in the landscape, this is absolutely associated with the West River. So this is a riverine wetland or a floodplain wetland. It's all gonna flood during those high water events. It's in green, it is a class two protected wetland. Um, overall, it's about 32 and a half acres from top to bottom from up here, which is this is um, Lasser Ceramics, just to orient you. 
so from about up there, there's about 3,100 feet of West River that is associated with this wetland. And the pond itself is about 1,400 feet long uh, and about three, three, three and a half acres. So that's what we're talking about here. So I, I love looking at aerial photographs of wetlands because they tell you so much. So you can see the spaces of open water that you're not necessarily going to see when you're walking by on the road or driving by. So th this wetland provides a lot, some good open water. It's got a lot of connections between that, which are likely wildlife corridors. Um, it goes, the wetland actually goes pretty much up to Lasser Ceramics. It's way, it, you know, it's, it's a good size wetland. And all through this area, it's very dense vegetation. There are other areas that were it's lighter vegetation and it all connects into the mill pond. So even this part down here, you know, there's multiple connections to the pond. And, you know, probably the biggest connection people have to their wetlands is that wildlife habitat and, and what, what these wetlands provide the community this being what you're listening to outside right now, um, <laughs> a wood frog calling, all that quacking that's going on. Um, I've, I've been listening to it every night lately. And as Leo mentioned, you know, we have species of greatest conservation need. You know, we, there's rare threatened and endangered species which are officially listed with either the state or the feds. Um, and then there are those species that they haven't reached that level of concern that they, they become a listed species, but nonetheless, they, they, we know that there's something going on with these populations. Wood turtles are known to be in this wetland, um, above, below it, and in the wetland itself. Um, so, and it is a species of greatest conservation need. The populations have been declining for some time. So it's one of those that, that we want to really look out for um, and do that wetland protection for. Another one is the American eel that, that Lael said. They, they are, they've monitored them up and downstream of the, the pond and the wetland. Uh, so they, and Lael can talk a lot more about these, but they'll climb up dams and things like that. They're just so very cool. The, the one that, and something that the West River provides, and this is again right around the wetland, is the eastern pearl shell mussel, which is a state listed threatened species. Um, and these all depend on very clean water, so we want to make sure that, that the water quality is maintained throughout this area, up and downstream of the pond. And you can see that the West River, the West River is pretty much one of the only locations in the state where this mussel and several other mussels, the West is known for its mussel populations. Um, and you can see that, that, that right in this region, there's a whole mess of them. So the, these are species that, that are right in town um, that you wanna be concerned about. And when you talk about that, you know, it being a, a complex of wetlands, this is the, the wetland we're talking about, Lowell Lake and all these wetlands in between. So, there is movement of all sorts of species through this system. And the one that I focus on, I'm a birder, so I have to talk about birds. Um, and while we don't have a species list for the mill pond and the wetland, we do have one for Lowell Lake, which is very close by. 76 different bird species have been documented on Lowell Lake. Things that you would expect on, a lo on lakes and wetlands, bald eagles, great blue herons, wood ducks, um, but some things that you wouldn't necessarily, white winged scoters, great egrets, which are like the size of great blue herons, but so all white, um, black burning and warblers, and I, I have to put in my favorite, which is the chestnut sided warbler. They're yeah. just so pretty. Um, so, you know, and if they're, if these are in Lowell Lake, you can be sure that they're using the pond and the wetland as habitat as well. Look for these. The spring salamanders. So what this is saying that spring salamanders are documented in wetlands all around Londonderry. 
but nobody's reported them from Londonderry. And the same thing for pickerel frogs. Well, you're surrounded by them, but nobody's officially documented them in Londonderry. So keep your eyes open. If you're hanging out around the wetland and walking around and listening to frogs, um, take a look at what they are. Uh, this is from the Vermont Herp Atlas, which is rep Reptile and Amphibian Atlas. Uh, it's a great resource and it documents and, and anytime, you know, I come across a wood turtle, I take a picture of it and I send it in. So, so we know where these populations are um, and where, you know, we need to do that kind of habitat protection. But these are right around you. They've got to be there. And, and again, one of the things Lael mentioned is that aquatic organism passage. Uh, there's only one culvert like directly associated with the wetland. Um, obviously the dam below it is, is a, an aquatic organism issue, but this culvert, which is right by the, the state garage, it sounds like it's probably okay. It's four feet wide, which is not that small a culvert. Um, however, when you look at the actual size it needs to be, it's only 37% of the size the culvert really needs to be to accommodate the water in the river. And this isn't even that big a tributary and it still would need a 12 foot culvert to pass all the flow. And, and the reason that's a concern is because as, as Lael was talking about, the temperatures certainly in the pond, because the pond is so shallow, and in the wetland itself, which is totally exposed to the sun, is going to warm up. That water is going to get pretty hot. And, and you know, wetlands are fish spawning and fish rearing areas. So during the summertime, when that water gets really hot, those fish are going to look for someplace cooler to go. And if they can't get through this culvert and go up the stream to that cooler, shady, messy habitat um, that Lael was referring to, it's going to be too warm for them. The West River going upstream is probably still going to be too warm for quite a ways, and I've got a picture of that too. Um, so, so these culverts and, and replacing those culverts, so they really allow aquatic organisms, the fish and the salamanders and the frogs, um, to move up and down through that as they're looking for the right temperatures and the right habitat is really important. When, when you look at the wetland itself, there are a few things that, that you know, you'll see. This is all Japanese knotweed, um, which obviously I'm sure many of you know about, very invasive, totally takes over habitat. At least it's still supporting a great blue heron over here. <laughs> um, and the, I know I've also noticed a lot of honeysuckle around the area and that's not good either. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is, this is Lasser uh, ceramics. So this is as you're driving south towards the intersection and towards the dam, this is the West River coming in. This is the head of the wetland right here. And you can see just from this illustration, all the sediment that's accumulated in this reach of the river. Um, and, and some of that is because it's coming downstream um, and, and it's flat here. So things are naturally going to settle out. But the wetland itself is going to slow the flow down and drop the sediment. And the dam obviously is going to accumulate that sediment. So while all of this should be that clean substrate that's, you know, water passing over and washing the sediments downstream all the time. Um, it's even way back here, which is probably almost three quarters of a mile up from, from Route 11. Um, it's already accumulating sediment back here. So that, that is certainly an issue that the sediment backs up. <clears throat> And the other thing I noticed, um, I, I actually drove through London Dairy just last weekend, so it was great. I got to take good pictures. <laughs> um, and this was, this is just where, you know, where there are some road runoff issues. <clears throat> There's gravel and sediment from the road, and this is obviously Mill Pond. 
itself, which is getting some of that runoff from one of the pull-offs right at the intersection of Jerry, um, the, of the, the road. And this is again, right along the, the wetland itself. So, you know, there, there are certainly things that, that could be looked at and, and addressed. Um, in, in so many ways, it's, it's, a, nice, it's a nice little wetland. Um, it provides some good habitat. It is, and we do have to keep in mind that it is a man-made wetland in a lot of cases because the dam is, is holding water back. Um, but it, it is providing some nice habitat and some, some great open space and bird habitat and amphibian habitat. So it, it's a neat, it's a very neat wetland. And that, those are, that's what I had. And I'm glad to talk about any of the other things. I have some other pictures if people want to get into it. Are, are you taking questions now? I'm glad to, and I think Lael, either for Lael or I, it's fine. Well, one of my questions was why, uh, why did you end the Atlantic salmon program? You are muted, Lael. Doesn't want to unmute. Sorry, my when you stopped sharing, then my PowerPoint completely took over and I couldn't get to Zoom. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so what was the question? The Atlantic Salmon Program? Yeah, how come you ended it? I didn't end it. <laughs> it's well. about my pay grade. <laughs> um, so the the program was ended by the um, Fish and Wildlife Service because they were the White River hatchery um, that they used to produce the salmon got flooded um, during Irene. So the hatchery blew out. Um, but the Fish and Wildlife Service um, made the decision to end the program because of the lack of return. So, you know, huge amount of effort um, over the years. It was a 40 year program of stocking these salmon um and not seeing the adults returning so millions of salmon going out tons of you know volunteer hours and coordinating the stocking to have a handful of fish returning the cost to benefit ratio just wasn't there um you know i suspect the way the program was run you know taking the adults spawning them out putting the fish out to rear I've done restoration projects on the west coast that were successful and it was all hinged around removing barriers let the fish do their thing, let them spawn, let them rear, let them survive. You know, the tributaries that are going to have, you know, the best survival are going to support the population, but they need to complete their life cycle. So that was sort of the, the approach out on the West Coast was let's restore the habitat and let the fish do their thing. Um, but in New England, there's so many dams, uh, you know, to get that, that level, we'd have to do a lot of work. Thank so you. that's why the program was uh, ended. Okay, we have a question in the chat. Somebody wants to know, what do you recommend re taking the dam down in London? Um, I, I, I would recommend that the dam be taken down and, and I'm glad to get into that if people want to. I do have some, some slides of the dam and what's going on with the dam, if you're interested in seeing them. Um, I and I will second Marie on that. Um, you know, I, I wasn't super pointed in the presentation, but it has been a priority for us to get these rivers back to being rivers. You know, that's what we wanna see. And Marie, as you talk about that, could you also talk about state regulations that will impact the existence of the dam? Sure. So, you know, when you, when you start, when you look at the dam itself, so the dam is here, and as I said, this is Lasser. So that, that sediment, the dam is about 20 feet high, and if you, these are topographic lines, these yellow lines, and if you follow that back, so the sediment is accumulating all the way back here <clears throat> from behind that dam. So that's a, that's a, a large habitat area to, to change 
from a river system to a wetland system and a lake system. It's a lot of area. When you look at the dam itself, so these are pictures that I took in 13 and 15. I haven't looked at it. Um, I haven't taken one of these shots in a while, but you can see that some of these, the yellow, the blue, and the green are the same, you know, over the years. And even in just two years, this has started to leak, this has started to leak. These are, are obviously very low water times of year. There's no water passing over the dam. And that's, be, you know, all that sediment is accumulated right to the top of that dam. <clears throat> and the dam is not in good shape. It's leaking like crazy. And that can be very dangerous. It's if something were to start, if, if one of those rocks starts to go and comes out of that dam, um, that's what happened. If you're familiar with the little park in Weston that we finally just removed the, the remnants of the dam that blew out in Irene, that was because of this kind of a situation. There was a, a hole in the dam and be, it got so bad and Irene put so much pressure on it that the whole thing went. Um, and I think I have noticed a shift, you know, I, when I, I started in 2012 and there was a lot of uh, hesitation with dam removal, but I think that that attitude has shifted because people are realizing the environmental impacts, but also the liability behind it and the fees associated with it. Um, you know, after Irene, when, when dams blew out, they were not allowed to be rebuilt um, under our stream alteration rules. Um, it would not be allowed to get a permit to, to rebuild a dam. So I think that the, the shift in attitude has changed over the years to be a little bit more open to the idea of, of dam removal. And then this again, the drought in 2016, when the water was really, really low, um, you know, the water's pretty much pouring out of that, that dam. And this is what the mill pond looked like in 2016 during low water. There's, there, it's not really, there's not really a pond left. It's a mud flat, um, very little water. I looked at it just a few days ago um, and there's, you know, eight, 12 inches of water in that whole pond. There's, there's, and the dam is 20 feet high. So there's 19 feet of sediment accumulated behind this dam. And were that dam to fail, 19 feet of sediment is going down. Um, and that's, that's kind of a scary thought if you're in the village. Well, and, apropos to that, our uh, same questioner in chat says if the dam were removed, what would happen to the uh, downstream businesses that are alongside the river right there? If the dam is removed properly, um, this, the, what happens during a dam removal is that the sediment is, the, the unstable sediment is removed and carted away. So that's, that's what needs to happen. Um, and this, this would be a significant project of removing sediment to the point where it's stable. And, you know, you, I know there, there in the past there was discussion what we love the sound of the moving water. Most dams are built on some form of bedrock, right? They didn't just put them in sand because that's obviously not going to be stable. So most of them have, are on some form of bedrock cascade some older waterfall, smaller waterfall below that. So it's, it's not necessarily a loss of that feature. Um, it's a loss of certainly the pond, but there is not really a pond left. And I, I wanted to give an example of Sweet Pond in Guilford, which we had to, it's a state park. The dam was sliding off of that bedrock and had to be, um, the dam had to be removed or, or replaced because it was a public park, they ended up replacing it. But this is what the pond, and this is a much larger pond, this is a 12 acre pond. Um, and that's what it looked like right after the dam got removed. Doesn't look very good. By that summer, 
the vegetation had already started to grow back. By May of 2018, this is what it looked like. And by August, you, you wouldn't necessarily have even known there was a pond there. The, chan, the stream channel had reformed. Um, and you know, so a lot of people are concerned that there, it's gonna look like a big mud hole. Um, that's not the case. There's so much seed stock in that sediment and soil uh, that that vegetation immediately starts to grow back. And that's a good thing because it stabilizes the sediments um, that, that would otherwise potentially move downstream. So- I think they had a rare wetland plant in there too that they found at that sweet pond. <clears throat> that makes after, sense. after it started growing back. So, and, and the other thing um, that Erwin just mentioned is that state regulations now are you know, there are new dam safety rules and the owner of the dam is now responsible for registering the dam with the state, having the dam inspected by a dam engineer um, to, to basically document that that dam is safe because as, as dams age, the way they, you know, we've put them in, this dam was built before 1900. Right, so it's been there a long time. It's got a lot of wear and tear on it. Again, if that dam or any dam on the landscape were to fail, somebody downstream is gonna suffer the cost of that. Um, and so we have recently, just as of last summer, put into place regulations that require dam owners to, to basically be responsible dam owners, to make sure their dams are maintained um, and to basically cover the costs of the dam safety program to be able to monitor that and require dam inspections and dam safety to guarantee dam safety to protect the, the you know the life and property of those who live near the dams. So, right, uh, and then on the flip side, um, there's we have gotten a lot of uh, federal monies, clean water monies to get dams removed. So we've been really, really successful in helping, you know, uh, working with partners to get funding to remove dams for free. And so, the concern about the businesses in town getting flooded, it's, it's actually the opposite. The, the dam and the, the sedimented in pond are more prone to flooding because as you probably witnessed in Irene, the distance between the top of the dam and the bottom of the bridge is very narrow. And as all those trees and sediments and stuff came down, it blocked that hole and all the water went through the village. Um, so the, the dam basically has caused the flooding. It did not prevent the flooding. There's no storage space for water because the dam and the pond are so silted in. The wetland itself held water back, which was probably very protective, um, but the dam itself was part of the problem. Yeah. You're less likely to flood if there's a normal river channel there than if there's a dam and a filled in mud pond. Yep. Yes. Thanks. Who decides at what point the dam has to be removed? And is it the town or the state? So the, the state has inspected the dam. The town does own the dam. The state has inspected the dam and it has received a poor dam safety rating for over a decade, right? So, the so we know the dam is in bad shape. Um, it is the town's decision whether or not the dam stays or goes. So that, that's the situation. So the, the, the rule, the statute is that town must inspect it, but does not necessarily have to act on an adverse finding? It will get to the point, the state has been inspecting it and it has received a poor rating for a very long time. There will come a point when it gets to the next level and that becomes what's called a dam order from the state where you have to do something. There are now a set of recommendations on what should be done 
at the dam to stabilize it so it doesn't fail. Um, but it will reach a point where it either fails catastrophically, which nobody wants that to happen, um, or it gets removed in the proper way. And that's what happened at, at Sweet Pond is the dam was, was in such bad shape that they had to, to drain the pond. Um, and then if the dam, like I had mentioned earlier, if the dam were to fail, um, there, we wouldn't allow it to be rebuilt. It just wouldn't meet our stream malt standards. So Marie, you talked about uh, hazardous silt, but you also talked about once the dam at Sweet Pond was removed, it, uh, it was a uh, basically uh, like a substrate for new vegetation. So in a, in a mill pond like ours, where you say there is basically 19 feet of silt, how much of that silt would have to be removed and how much could stay? That's a really good question. And I would say a lot of it would have to go. Um, the, the thing with Sweet Pond is that it's a, it's a wider pond on a very small stream. So there's not the West River trying to move all that sediment all the time. Um, so that one was able to grow in and stabilize I would say that a channel, what we call, the reason I said that culvert was four feet wide and needed to be 12 feet wide, we call that bank full width that allows the channel, the, pro the proper amount of room to move the two year flood. What, what you're seeing on the landscape running off snow melt and stuff like that when the river rises up, but doesn't flood its banks. That's what we call bank full and the West River through that is probably bank full the width of the pond. So I would say a, a good part of that would have to be removed. Right. And so um, we normally we, we normally work with consultants. Um, you know, there's they can do alternative analyses, you know, to look at different options. And then, you know, through the design phase, you know, we've worked with consultants to determine, you know, how much sediment needs to be removed. Sometimes we like to, because it's so sediment starved below the dam, sometimes we like to leave a little bit of sediment in there so that, you know, during these high flow events, it can slough off slowly and fill in those sort of, um, you know, that hungry, the big bouldery stuff that typically tends to be downstream of the dam to get that sort of transition smooth. But we, we always work with, you know, professionals to get that design so that it's going to be compatible. Um, with that river. Yeah. You got to connect the top to the bottom from, from the where profile. the sediment starts mm -hmm. to where the sediment stops below it. Well, uh, one of our members, uh, Helen Hammond, has a neighbor who's been involved with dam removal. And uh, Helen, you're still here, right? And um, uh, I believe your neighbor, Gary, is a, uh, uh, an authority on this. Can you unmute? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm not so sure that I'm an authority per se, um, but uh, I, I first would like to compliment uh, both uh, Lael and Marie. You guys have done a great job of covering uh, the, the, a lot of the aspects of dam removal right off the right off the bat here. Um, I work for a consulting firm in Massachusetts, Tyne Bond, um, and I've been involved in several dam removals, um, and it's a real passion of mine because the the benefits that you see uh, immediately after dam removal are they're real they're they're very easy to appreciate um, however there's a lot of different aspects to the dam removal process uh, a lot of people are attached to dams um, lots of folks want to see them removed but there there are the social aspects to uh to, to dam removal that need to be weighed into it the permitting is extensive. Uh, it can take several years. Uh, the costs are significant, even with grants and funding uh, provided from from outside uh, from outside sources. Uh, I think that the uh, both Leo and Marie did a really great job hitting on a couple of things. Um, everybody has seen the mill pond now, like late August, where it's completely dried up and it's a real um, it's a sight to behold. Um, and I can envision, you know, 10 years from now, if um, a, 
if folks really start to um, start to come up with a game plan, you you could you know look to um, really um, reshape how that whole area um, looks um, to speak to sediment management. There's options available to reuse that sediment along the uh, the banks of the river. Um, you can do some armament along the sides, uh, which I know some folks don't like to hear, but you know the the designs that go into this um, can can really reshape the the that whole area along Route 11. I just did some quick calcs, like, uh, and it, it seems like there's probably like 75 to like 100,000 cubic yards of sediment just upstream in the mill pond. Um, some of that would probably be fine to wash downstream to, to Mary's point, uh, but some of it would probably be, need to, to, to be managed mechanically so that you didn't have like a one-time flush. Uh, the state of Vermont has some really great resources, and I would encourage anybody that's uh, interested in learning more about dam removal to just Google Vermont dam removal. Um, I, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, there's a couple of really great presentations and resources there to, to educate yourselves about all the different aspects of it. Uh, the dam removals that I've been involved with have been um, pretty easy. Um, in the sense that either the dam was failing because the owners could no longer afford the upkeep or um, there are real safety hazards. Um, they're in, in, in urban areas. And, and unfortunately, one of the dam removals that I worked on, um, several people had died because they had gotten sucked into the low level intake. Um, very tragic, but uh, all in all, it really helps to link resource areas. And to Marie's point, the culvert that's coming in from, is it Thompsonburg? Um, yeah, the, you know, there, there's, there's smaller uh, opportunities here to certainly improve the, the resource areas that I have. And one of the questions that I started typing out, um, but then just stopped uh, that I had for Marie was, how does the state balance what would certainly be significant impacts to the wetlands upstream of Mill Pond in the impoundment still? How does the state balance that with you know, a dam removal project that also has benefits. Yeah, that we, we have had lots and lots of internal discussions about that because when you remove the dam, you're obviously changing the elevation of the, the wetland upstream and it's gonna change the wetland. It's, it's likely to make it smaller because you're not impounding that, that whole elevation. Um, However, that is the, the natural condition, right? The, the, the original form of that wetland is likely to return. There won't be as much wetland, but that, that's, there's still gonna be a wetland there. So that has been the decision that restoration um, of the habitat to the more original habitat, whatever that is, um, is is some is the goal. So we will lose some wetland habitat, gain some riverine habitat, and that's you know that that's the balance. And and the state has chosen to to go towards the natural habitat. Yeah, the the wetlands permitter um, Rebecca Chalmers. It's restoration is the priority. And I would just add that um, my real role in uh, dam removal is actually managing contaminated sediment. In, in Massachusetts, nothing is more common than a dam that has uh, contaminants in the impoundment, whether it's from anthropogenic sources like stormwater runoff, or if there's been upstream, upstream releases of hazardous materials. And um, looking at the West River, I'm not sure that that sediment probably is going to be too contaminated. Um, there's no indus industry uh, up, upstream. Um, the storm water inputs from the road are probably fairly minimal. So I, I would guess that most of that would probably be suitable for downstream release. Um, would you guys agree? Yeah, I, would. I don't know. I um, <laughs> Go ahead, Leo. They found arsenic at Sweet Ponds and Sweet Ponds pretty remote out in the middle of nowhere. So it just depends on 
um, you know, the testing results and, and what's there. Um, but even still, we wouldn't want to, you know, release a ton and smother the downstream, you know, gravels. We usually do anytime there's the potential of historic industry um, and at a mill pond, there probably was, um, we'll do sediment testing to monitor that and see what's there before we allow flow downstream. How does it impact uh, the wildlife downstream of the dam removal? Fish, mammals? You want to take that, Leo? Uh, the, the sediment or the contaminants? Just when you remove the dam, you get rid of whatever sediment you can. That, that running water now that was, in, that was held back, how do, you've increased the flow. How does that all affect downstream wildlife? It, it, it helps it, um, I'll tell you that much, because now you're not going to be impounding the, the river and increasing those water temperatures. You're going to have um, a flowing river that what you'll see typically, we call it hungry water. So since it's, it's sediment starved below, you tend to get really coarse material um, and not a lot of gravels until you start seeing, you know, tribs, tributary inputs and so on and so forth. So you're going to, you're going to, you know, increase the complexity of that habitat downstream by, you know, having that, those gravels and, and sand is not a bad thing. You know, that's, that's sort of the glue that holds the, the stuff together. It's when you smother everything downstream, that's going to have impacts to your macro invertebrates. Um, so with dam removal, it's a balancing act. And that's why we work closely with the consultants to figure out what amount is going to help downstream to fill in those sort of that coarse bouldery type stuff um, without smothering, you know, the whole, the whole bed. Um, so it's a balancing act between those two when, when we're doing dam removals. And, and the flow is not actually gonna change. The amount of water in the channel is the amount of water in the channel. Um, so, and, and the dam is not holding any water back because the pond is totally silted in. So whatever flows are going, um, are, are moving down the channel. There, there's not gonna be a change in flow. The only change is gonna be the, the flow above the dam um, moving back into a normal channel, a normal flow that is, is carrying the water and the sediments as, as a river is supposed to do. So if the, if the dam were removed and the ponds start to grow in, um, it looks like all that, uh, um, all that knotweed was moved right in, would you say? When we do this, we're, we're very conscious of that possibility. So yes, that would happen if, unless, if you just leave it on its own. Um, we didn't have that issue at Sweet Pond because there wasn't a, not a lot of knotweed up there. Um, but here it would be obviously a really big concern. So we would want to plant those margins, those newly exposed soils with, with native vegetation um, as quickly as possible and get that established so that it, it will at least compete with, um, not necessarily outcompete, and then, and then monitor that over the next several years to keep the knotweed under control. So the native plants are, are able to be established. Now we doesn't like to grow in the shade. So if you can get the native plants in there and up and growing, you have a better chance. Anybody else? <clears throat> Marie or Leo, do you have anything else to add? No, I just really appreciate everybody um, showing up and for your attention and, and for listening to us. Thank you. Leo, I have one last question. Um, how many undocumented dams are there versus the documented? So I think that they have been doing better with inventory. Um, I'm not dam safety, so we have a different um, um, de uh, not department, but a different sector that is under dam safety, under DEC. Um, and they are the ones that are responsible for all the inventory. And 
I'm sure there's, we're finding new ones all the time. So, um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of undocumented dams out there, but they're the ones that are really responsible for that sort of inventory. And if we know of sort of renegade dams, should we be, should we be reporting them to the state in some way? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me about it or tell Lael about it. Um, the, a, a photograph, a GPS point off of a map, that kind of stuff is where we're constantly updating that, that database. We removed three dams last year, four dams, two, three of which were not ever mapped previous. To take Some of the them. worst ones are the smallest ones. The, they're everywhere. There, there are big ones out there. There are small ones out there, lots and lots of small ones on medium size and small tributaries. Um, and, and again, we can't, we can't take them out if we don't know they're there. They're like a Most nuisance. Most of them are in bad shape. Right. Okay, well, with that, I will uh, also before thank you, everybody. Before you, before you leave, Erwin, I got two yes. things to say. Any river otters on the West River? I would say sure. Um, there got, there've got to be. I've, I've seen mink. Um, otters tend to, to like, you know, the, the margins, the setbacks, the lakes. Um, though I would absolutely think there are, there are otters around. They're just, they're very secretive. They're not easy to find on the landscape. Right, okay. Um, the only other thing, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, right along with this, we have another presentation, the London Dairy Conservation Commission. I don't know, if, were you gonna bring this up, Erwin? Oh, go ahead, Steve. Uh, Vernal Pools, mm -hmm. Steve Fascio from the Vermont Center of Eco Studies will be doing a Zoom presentation um, Thursday, April 29th. I'll give everybody a second to take out their iPhones and their piece of paper to write this down. Everybody doing that? April 29th, Thursday at 7 p.m. Fascinating discussion about kind of what you guys, a little bit about talking, it's kind of a nice transition of what you've been talking about, how these small little pools around Wyndham County and across Vermont get filled with frog eggs and salamander eggs. And um, the one just down here on the West River that I walk just about every day dried up over the last two weeks because it's been so dry. So oh, dry. And, and um, you know, can they come back? Um, once they dry up and they're full of eggs and they dry out, is that gone for the season or can they return? So this will be kind of an interesting presentation, Zoom presentation on April 29th, 7 p.m. Vernal Pools. And like this one, we'll be posting the uh, Zoom link and scheduling information on uh, Facebook and elsewhere for you to uh, capture. And also, um, uh, you can also send us your email address if anybody would like to be on our email distribution list. Uh, I'm also reminded uh, that I forgot to mention uh, one of our neighbors, Larry Gubb, who lives across the road from Mill Pond, who uh, I guess couldn't join us tonight, uh, mentioned the following uh, species that he's observed over the years. He's seen snowy egret, snapping turtles, Canada geese, mink, beaver, and he thinks otter. So the otter is still a question mark. <laughs> That's great. Okay, and uh, this, uh, this talk, as all of them, will be on the London Dairy Conservation Commission uh, YouTube channel for yourselves to review or anybody to watch. And remember, it's not the London Dairy New Hampshire Conservation Commission channel. Don't go there. We have our own. It says Vermont and title. All right, everybody. Thanks very much again. And uh, good night to all of you. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks to our speakers, Marie and Leo. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.